Let me welcome you to the broadcast today. We are so happy that you came and are watching with us today. Looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us. We've been in a series for the last several weeks called Different Stories of Transformation. And we have been looking at different Bible accounts of people whose lives have been changed, transformed by Jesus Christ. And we've looked at a number of different characters throughout the scripture. And today we're going to look at an individual man from the city of Capernaum and his situation and how Jesus changed his life. Um, even today, Jesus can change lives. And uh, many people are uh, have given testimony to that. In fact, if you go to our website after the broadcast, you'll see story after story of transformations of people's lives and how Jesus has made a difference in their life. I hope you'll take time to look at that. Today, I'm going to look at how Jesus changed the life of a man that we known as the paralytic. Now, the paralytic was, was a man that had physical ailments, and uh, his was so severe that he was incapable of moving himself, of walking, of, of going anywhere. Physical ailments, of course, are of the, the most demanding needs that anybody can experience in this life. And this is especially true when those maladies become uh, painful or they become debilitating. Uh, the physical, don't you know, ha has a way of just grabbing us. It kind of grabs us by the, by the front and, and, and gets our attention like, like nothing else really does. Um, if you take a look at uh, the average prayer list, you're going to see that the vast majority of those prayer requests on that list have to do with some kind of physical need or physical ailment that somebody's asked us to pray for. And it is so easy, isn't it, to ignore our sin or even to ignore God, okay? We can do that, you know, backache, headache, um, a leg that doesn't work, it's easy to, to ignore sin and God, but hard to ignore those things that affect our bodies. The physical, of course, is real. Pain does exist. It's not a figment of our imagination. They do exist. Uh, but as they say, <laughs> the struggle is real. Uh, many of you are, fear, are experiencing that. We have people that are experiencing severe physical pain, difficulties, uh, limitations. And so I don't mean to minimize any of those things, but simply to say that the physical has a way of really grabbing our attention like nothing else does. And such was the case of a man from Capernaum. Uh, he lived every day with a condition that had paralyzed his legs there was no cure. There was no hope for him until he heard that Jesus had come to town. And so with that, I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 2, when we're going to focus on this chapter today. Mark chapter 2, uh, kind of the backstory. Jesus begins to leave Galilee, and he goes to the, to the town of Capernaum. This is a, a city that was on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. And there he goes and he enters into a house to begin to preach to a group of people. And suddenly news of Jesus is in town and the house just becomes overwhelmed with people. It is packed. I mean, sardine church, if you would. Wall-to-wall -wall people as they're coming to hear Jesus preach the word. Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 3, the scripture says, And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was bore of four. So because they heard Jesus was in town, uh, this man who's described as being sick of the palsy is, is carried towards the house where Jesus is. This individual suffers from a paralysis. It's a loss of, of a muscle working, muscle structure. We don't know how long he's had this condition. We don't know what caused the condition, but he's in a bad state. He can't do anything, and so now his friends have brought him to this location. Now, verse 4, And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press. Now, Get the picture. They're carrying this guy on a stretcher, and they come to the house where Jesus is at. And as they get there, they can't get in. 
I mean, the, the place is so full of people, wall-to-wall -wall people, they can't possibly slide in carrying the stretcher. And I don't know how far they came. Uh, imagine their utter disappointment as they had carried this guy in a stretcher and they brought him to this place and now they can't get in to see Jesus. How, how just crushing that must have been, how the loss of hope that just flooded their hearts at this point. Um, think about how they, they felt. But the verse goes on to say, and when they could not come nigh unto him because of the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Now, in an act of just t total desperation, they decide we're, we're going to see Jesus one way or the other. And so somebody comes up with the, with the idea of, of we, can, we, we can't get in through the front door, we're going to get in from the roof. And so somehow they manage to hoist this guy on a stretcher up upon the rooftop, and then they begin to, to tear away the, the roofing right in the middle of the, of, of the roof so that they can come in and lower this guy. Now, now, kind of think about it. Think about the size of hole. This wasn't just a little tiny hole. They had to get the stretcher, and we don't know how big the guy was, but it would be sizable. So think about the size of the hole. And as Jesus is preaching here, the debris begins to fall, and, and suddenly people look up and they see the roof opening up. Now, uh, I kind of imagine Jesus looking up and smiling, uh, I, I'm sure the homeowner was not smiling, but 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 immediately everybody's looking up and the message is stopped because of this phenomena that's taking place as they're bringing this guy in. Now, the paralyzed man and his friends didn't come to this meeting because of the teaching and preaching of Jesus. They didn't come there because they thought, well, we can go away with some solid biblical truth. Okay. That's not the reason why they showed up to this meeting at all. They didn't come thinking, wow, maybe, maybe we'll, we'll grow in our, in our faith. That, that wasn't it whatsoever. Uh, they came there for one purpose, one purpose, one specific purpose. In fact, it was pretty obvious as to why they came and why they brought the guy to Jesus in this setting here. He was paralyzed. He couldn't walk. And they had heard somewhere that Jesus could help him, that Jesus could, could, could touch him, could, could, could alleviate their problem. And that is why they came. That's the reason that drove them there. And it is at this point, folks, that Jesus takes the opportunity to teach us an, a tremendous insight, even though this wasn't their intention to be here. And, and here's what we're going to see as we move throughout this narrative. What you feel is your most pressing need may not be your primary need. Sometimes we feel because of the physical that this is, this is the most important thing. And I'm sure if you ask this man on the stretcher, what's your greatest need, buddy? What, what, what is it that I can pray for you about? You know, he, he probably would look at you dumbfounded like, you know, I'm paralyzed. What, what do you think? And yet, in all of our lives, there are different scenarios like that. There are pressing needs. And sometimes we think they become the focal point, and yet they may not be the primary need that you actually have. Verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. So Jesus is there, and he witnesses their faith. Now, whose faith is he talking about? Well, obviously the four guys that, that brought this man here. They, they had such faith that they were willing to, to do the unthinkable, you know, to, to hoist this guy up and then lower him down. What an amazing, extraordinary uh, length that they went to help this paralytic. And so Jesus is impressed by that. But then Jesus does something that nobody in the room expects. He looks down at the guy that's there and says to him, your sins are forgiven. Okay. Amazing. Isn't that nice? And, and they must have thought, well, yeah, that's nice, but, that, but that's not why we came. Uh, we didn't come to get the sins forgiven. We, we came for something else. We came to be healed. We came to, for this man to be able to walk, okay? I mean, 
didn't Jesus know this? I mean, Jesus, of course, nothing gets by him, but could he have gotten by him? Could he have been confused as to why this guy had shown up? Everybody there knew why the guy was there. Even if they never met the man, they knew why he had come. What this guy needed more than anything else in his mind was he needed a miracle for his legs to start to work because he couldn't walk. That's what he thought was his most pressing and urgent need at the moment. <laughs> and obviously, this had to be a big letdown, didn't it? I mean, he had come, they had gone through all that they did, and, and, and the, the moment of truth, ta-da, you know, your sins are forgiven. What a, a letdown. <laughs> so obviously, the man on the stretcher wasn't happy. The four guys that brought him weren't happy. But there was another group that was also watching this, and they also were not happy. There was a group of religious leaders that really became incensed by what they saw, by what Jesus did. They weren't just disappointed. They were angry. Uh, look at verses 6 and 7. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their heart, why doth this man speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only. So here it is. The Jewish leaders are here, and they're witnessing. They probably came out to hear about this Jesus and his ministry. They were rather experts in the law and in religious things. And um, Jesus has said, your sins are forgiven. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're the ones you go through when you want forgiveness. If you want forgiveness of sins, we're the guys, not, not him. And so they were very upset over that because, you see, forgiveness was complicated. Okay, Forgiveness wasn't as simple as Jesus saying your sins are forgiven. It's it, it, way more complicated than that. You have to, first of all, get a, a sheep, a spotless sheep, and then you've got to go to the temple. And when you get to the temple, you've got to stand in line until finally it's your turn. And then the priest takes the sheep and he slaughters that sheep, and he puts the blood on the altar, and he says a few words, and then you're forgiven. But you're only forgiven for a while, because a little while later, you have to come back and do this whole thing over and over again, year after year. And so forgiveness was not something really simple in their minds. You can't just announce to someone, hey, your sins are forgiven. That's not how it works. Besides, who does Jesus think that he is to say such a thing? I mean, only God can, can, could say that and say your sins are forgiven. And so the paralytic, his friends, and the crowd are all disappointed. And, the, and the, the Jewish leaders here, the scribes, they're angry at what's going on. I mean, just imagine the drama that's taking a place here. Look now, if you would, to verses 8 and 9. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your heart? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise, take up thy bed, and walk. Jesus was saying simply this, I, I, I get it. I know why the paralytic is here. I didn't miss that. I know that he's come because he thinks that I could heal him or he's going to be cured or something of that nature. I understand that. I understand what he thinks his most pressing need is. I understand what he's feeling and, and what's going on here. I didn't miss that. But there's something more important going on. And here's what I want, don't want you to miss here. In the midst of what Jesus is trying to convey, nobody cared about their sins being forgiven. They, they weren't excited about that, you know. Jesus knows what the paralytic needs most isn't what he thinks he needs most. And so again, he's trying to emphasize the, the, this, this uh, message for us here what you feel is your most pressing need may not be your primary need. They're missing that. So what is it when you think of it? What is it that you want the most? What is it that we typically want the most, that think we need the most in this life? What is it that consumes our desires, our prayers with such urgency and fervor? Well, to kind of think about these things, certain things like our health, okay? We want to be healthy. We want to feel good. We, we want to live long. 
you know, we want to, to be in, in good shape. We, we want health, good health. We want to be pain free. Or maybe we want to consider prosperity. We want stuff. We want to get things and have nice things and to enjoy stuff. Prosperity. Or maybe it's companionship. We don't want to be lonely. We want people to love us. We want to be around people that are fun. We want to interact with them. Companionship. Or maybe, maybe it's recognition. That is, we want people to know that we are somebody. And we'll talk about our job, or we'll talk about the career we once had, or we'll talk about our accomplishments because it kind of feeds that need. Or maybe it's just comfort. We just want a comfy chair. We want life to be comfortable. We don't want stress. We don't want problems. And if there's there's too much drama, too much issues, we just want to push it out of the way. And we sometimes think that these are the things that are the most important in life. And if you'll go back and think through your prayer time and the, and the requests that you have for people, I, I bet that probably most of the prayer requests that you have are dominated by something that falls into these categories. Now, now hear me, these things aren't necessarily bad things. It's not wrong, okay, to want to be in good health, and it's not wrong to enjoy things, and it's not wrong to want to, to not be lonely. I mean, those things are all fine and, and good, and I'm not suggesting otherwise. But on, on our list of things most important, Forgiveness just doesn't make that list. Forgiveness isn't on there. We're listing all these needs, and forgiveness isn't really crossing our mind at this point. Yeah, we, we, we probably do need forgiveness if we think about it, but, but right now, there are other things that are much, much more needful, at least in our mind, right? We think those are the, the, the urgent things. And so Jesus, when he comes and he says to the poor guy that's crippled here, your sins are forgiven, uh, there's a lot of confusion in the room there. Now, obviously, it's easier for somebody to say your sins are forgiven than for them to actually be forgiven, because anybody that can speak could say the words, thy sins be forgiven thee. Okay, we could say that, but what's the reality? And after all, how would we even know if that took place. I mean, it's not like, you know, things light up or there's a, there's a, a you know, a, a darkening of the sky or rainbow appears or something of that nature. How, how would we do that? Well, he goes on in verse 10, 11, and it says this, but that you may know that the son of God hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. <laughs> the paralytic's life, watch this, is just about to be transformed. I mean, something awesome is going to happen to him. He, in fact, Jesus is going to heal the man in two ways. He's going to be healed both physically, which he came for, and spiritually. So Jesus gives him sort of a double blessing, if you would, here, as he's going to be healed both. And the crowd sees this, and, and they're amazed, because here's this crippled guy that they didn't think he was going to get healed, and suddenly Jesus says, get up, and the guy gets up, and they're st astonished by it. Verse 12, And immediately he arose and took up his bed and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. They had never been to a church service like that before. I mean, this was utterly amazing that took place there. But I want you to, to capture this. The, the whole reason why Jesus healed people physically was not just to heal them physically. It was to, to emphasize the fact that he had come to heal us spiritually, okay? That he had the power to forgive our sins, to, to heal us spiritually, uh, here's the point. The spiritual isn't always easy to see, is it? I mean, it's not the tangible, and so it's hard for us to sometimes see and grasp that it's actually taking place. It's, it's just like the air that we breathe. We don't see the air, but it's there, and it is absolute necessity if we're going to have life. Well, the same with the spiritual. You don't see it like the tangible, but it's an absolute necessity if you want to have life. The physical healings that took place were all temporary. Keep that in mind. 
Nothing wrong with physical healing, but every physical healing is temporary. Why? Because this guy, this paralytic, one day in the future got sick and died. In fact, nobody that Jesus healed st is still alive today right? We don't go back to these people, the blind man and, and others, and they're, they're walking around still today. No, they've all died. Something happened in their life afterwards that they didn't recover from. So healing is great and wonderful, but it's always temporary. Sadly, what got celebrated here was not the eternal, um, ongoing uh, empowerment of the Spirit of God in, in the salvation of souls, but rather what got celebrated here was the temporary um, uh, uh, you know, healing of this guy's legs. And so uh, they focused on what they desired most and sadly bypassed what God had desired most. Once again, friend, what you feel is your most pressing need may not be your primary need. Friend, our biggest and most important issue in life is our relationship with God. There's nothing more important than your relationship to God. The question is, am I right with God? In light of my sin, am I eternally connected to the Heavenly Father? The reason Jesus came to earth was not to give wealth and health, but rather he came to deal with the most important issue, our sin. The paralytic's condition was illustrative of the condition of people without Jesus. We are all representative of that paralytic, and that is without Christ, we're like he was. We're crippled. We are incapable of reaching God, and we have no hope. We're just there. Our muscles don't work. We can't do anything. That's how hopeless and desperate we are without Jesus. And so he illustrates it through the physical here. God often allows those physical struggles to stay in your life and in my life so that they bring us to a place of desperation. Just like these guys were so desperate that it led them to where? It led them to do whatever they had to do to get to Jesus. My friend, that's the most pressing issue in your life, is you need Jesus. There's nothing more important. There's nothing more vital. There's nothing that should take the place of you having Jesus Christ. And those troubles and difficulties in our lives ought to drive us, ought to move us to a place that we discover the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Even if the room is crowded, even if we have to rip open the roof, we need to get to Jesus. And so your primary need is your connection to God. Simply put, your primary need is forgiveness. You need his forgiveness. You need what Jesus said to the paralytic as he looked down and said, thy sins are forgiven. That's what we need. And we can't get it from ourselves. We are totally incapable of doing it. Forgiveness comes only through Jesus Christ. There's no other place of forgiveness. Rituals like baptism and communion and prayers can't get you forgiveness. Only Jesus can. There's nothing wrong with those things, but we're forgiven only through Christ. It is when you and I recognize our sin and we repent of it and we turn to Jesus and we fall upon his mercy. I mean, what, what could the paralytic do for Jesus? Nothing. What could he offer Jesus? Nothing. What, what could he do prior to Jesus's healing of him? Nothing. And that's all we can do is come to Jesus and say, here's my need and accept his grace. If you will come to Christ and seek his forgiveness, my friend, your life will never be the same. You will experience transformation. I mean, do you think the paralytic when he left there was the same guy? Absolutely not. He, he was, his life was never the same again. And neither will yours be when you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. So let me share with us as we uh, bring our time down 
to what you and I can be doing this week in response to this message that we've heard. And so here's your move for this week, and I challenge you to do this. First of all, I want you to make a list of four people that you know that need Christ. Think about it carefully, and on a piece of paper or on your device, put down their their names, four individuals. The second thing I want you to do once you've identified that is I want you to begin to pray for those individuals that they will recognize their need. See, nobody comes to Jesus until they know their needs. The paralytic knew his need. He didn't realize his spiritual need, but he understood that there was a need in his life that, that he could not fulfill, that only Jesus could. And so pray that the persons that you have on that list will understand their need for Jesus. And then the last thing I want you to do is I want you to invite them to watch the broadcast. I want you to invite them to do that. I want them to hear about what Jesus can do for them. They need Christ. Uh, Church is wonderful. Religion can can be helpful, but none of those things get us forgiveness. Only the, the shed blood of Jesus Christ can do that. And so, my friend, I pray that you'll take that challenge. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, reach out to us. We would love to help you with this and to to facilitate that uh, by by leading you to Jesus so that you might know Him as Savior and Lord. Uh, I want to close our time and just uh, uh, with a brief prayer for you and for our audience. And afterwards, our praise team is going to come back and and going to lead us in another song of worship. And so... uh, Let's join together in a time of prayer. Father, thank you for your amazing love and forgiveness. And even though we don't deserve it, we are forever grateful that Jesus made it possible. I pray if there's anybody listening that's never received your forgiveness of sin, that today they will call unto you and be gloriously saved. I pray for believers, Lord, that they would seek to be forgiving people like you are, and that they would also seek to help others to know the forgiveness that comes through Jesus Christ alone. Thank you, God. Thank you for your blessings. In Jesus' name I ask this. Amen.